Yeah, one of the things we were kind of toying with the idea of coming up with basically deer goggles. Yeah. You can put this put this headset on. Not and, beer and... goggles, deer goggles. <laughs> <laughs> or, or both. I've had the others before. <laughs> they're, so they're pretty similar. I can attest. They're pretty similar. <laughs> The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Man, it's almost food plot season, Jared, and Deer Grow is one of those products that has really changed the way that we plant food plots and the success we've seen from them. No doubt. I've been, you know, trying to plant food plots my, my entire, you know, whitetail hunting career, which is a little shorter than yours, but the minute that I started or that I, you know, I realized that I could get Deer Grow back into some of these remote plots where I couldn't get lime or fertilizer, especially in the 50 pound bag, you know, format, mm-hmm. so everything was changed. You know, I could get into these spots uh, moving forward with a, with a backpack sprayer and that since escalated to these 40 or 60 uh, gallon sprayers and we're doing upwards of you know five to ten acre food plots just with your grow and having phenomenal success yeah and i mean with the price of fertilizer lime diesel everything this year i mean what better way to get in there and grow a successful food plot at about a third of the cost check out deer grow at deergrow.com and we're back hey yo on our podcast episode 108 nick not here snowed in snow day not snowed in from WikiLeaks, but snowed in. in good That's right. Yeah, no, I'm with you. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Stick with it. Yeah. Uh, it is December 22nd. If you're listening to this, it's sometime early 2023. Welcome to 2023. If we didn't say that last podcast, because I don't know when this is dropping. But uh, we're going to do a better job of trying to get uh, more real time here after the holidays. So probably the next podcast that you hear after this will be like within a week. Getting closer. Yeah. Tighten them up. Tighten them up. Um, yeah, because we may have done your Kansas double double dip post thing. We'll figure it out. When it drops, it drops. We're trying to get better. Drop it like it's hot. Uh, anyways, <clears throat> uh, I hate to be like the Grinch of the holiday spirit. But it's also from a hunting standpoint, we're like winding down. Yeah, definitely winding down. Um, it's cool to see some survivals, uh, uh, survivors. In fact, uh, that that big eight from behind the house was on my camera at six fifteen this morning, mm. working through the food plot. Hey, give him another shot. I'm gonna try to kill him with a trad bow. Mm. I'm a, uh, I bought the one you just got in the mail yesterday. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I bought a Hoyt Satori uh, recurve, which is awesome. I forgot to bring it today. Sorry. Um, it's awesome. I did shoot it last night under the lights, too. I like, couldn't wait. I was like, oh, I got to go out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got uh, Easton Axis Trad Carbons. So they look like a wooden arrow with feathers. They are feathered, but it's actually a carbon. I've got a 100-grain insert on that he- on that front plus 150 grain. The arrows uh, came Copeland. pre-built? I had them pre-built from Three Rivers Archery. Okay. Uh, so they're like a trad recurve specialty. So yeah, so they cut 29 three quarters. Um, they put the 100 grain brass insert in the front. And then I got, I've got i got 150 grain fill points, but I'm going to end up shooting the um, Magnus Stinger 150s out of that. Cool. So I think I calculated it. I'm sitting <clears throat> at about... 18 and 18.2% FOC on that thing. Yeah. You shot it last night? Yeah. How old was that? Uh, 50% kill rate. At 20 yards? 15-ish. Yeah. Yeah. Does it seem like... It zings are faster. Are catch, catching on? You're like, okay, I can yeah. I see where I'm aiming or... Yeah. I'm, um, yes. I, I was, by the end of it, I was getting better. Um, I also don't have my, um, my glove yet. So, like, right. it, you know, after... 10 shots, like my fingers hurt. My yep. fingers hurt. Yeah. No, your back's good. You heard one, like a three, three uh, bear? I did. I, I've got a, um, a tab, but I also have, I bought the, I don't know what they call them, like the easy no fingers or something, which like actually stick on the string that, you know, you just grab onto them without oh, okay. a tab. I'm going to try both of them. I've heard mixed reviews on that, so I don't know. Um, I also might try, uh, I don't know if it's necessarily Bomars or something, but one of those nose um, to try to just give myself a better anchor point. Okay. Um, I'm shooting 50, 52 pound limbs on that thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it feels substantial. <laughs> Does it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can hold it back. There's no let off. I, mean, I can hold it back, but I mean, you know, five seconds in it's, 
the shakes are coming. Mm. Um, so I was trying to just get muscle memory going. Um, well, you're not supposed to hold it, right? No, I mean, you want to be muscle, muscle memory in on release. Like, right. I mean, it should be pretty, not, you know, one motion. It's not like you thing. draw ahead of time. It's like I'm yeah, ready I'm to shoot. Yeah, I'm not drawing draw and, and holding. Go. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm on them and just... Yeah, yeah, on almost one motion, smooth motion. So, it's cool. It, um, it sings, man. Well, first of all, I'm really happy with the arrow build. Yeah. Um, that much weight forward on that arrow with feathers. I mean, dude, it flies true. Like I was watching those things, and I mean, I, I'm talking lasers, just like, and nice. I mean, and solid impact. You'd think that'd be one of the toughest things because you, you're not. It's not a release. Correct. It's kind of coming off all yeah. cattywampus. No, and I mean, it was it was clean, smooth, hitting targets. You know, no no fishtail or anything. Mm. Um, so I feel good about that. It's just anchor points, really. I mean, whole whole new mindset, right? And I mean, it's, um, yeah. I don't know how far I'll go with it, but it was it one was, of those. It things. was either that or a crossbow for you, huh? Yeah. Well, we had to go one way or the well, other. Well, we were laughing. We we're like, hey, it seems like. What do we say about the gun seasons? We're like, ah, oh, it seems like you know you got to have a gun to like be successful. And I was like, I took a step back. I bought a trad bow. <laughs> Yeah, no, I can see why you did that. Though. Um, that would be appealing. Yeah, I, I kind of just, uh, and I mean, late season for me is um, the kids don't really hunt much in the late season, and dude, it's uh, you know a few weeks except for Ohio, we've got a lot longer. Um, so I've got a bunch of doe tags. Um, so like, if I could go out and potentially shoot a, a, a mature doe with a trad bow, like I'll be all jacked up. Heck yeah. Um, if if for some reason that buck would happen to get somewhat on a pattern on my food plot, I would absolutely try to kill him with trap. It would be, be sick, but yeah, you know, I, I'm how, trying how to, how tall is it? Uh, like six, 62 inches, 62 inches. So five feet. Whoa. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. They're big. So is that a, would that technically be a, a recurve bow? It is a recurve. Or is it a long bow? No, it's a recurve. Yep. It's got, uh, I've got, I got the 19 inch riser. So they make a 17, 19 and 21 inch riser 17 is like kind of the hunting one um but i've had i've heard mixed reviews about smaller risers and just the the ability to to shoot smoother on it uh -huh. and i you know it was a week of looking at forums um 21 is more of your target riser right so you're uh, just in between i'm in between and then um standard medium size medium length limbs on that one you could get shorter limbs i think but um accuracy wise and and even just you know the ability to to get some extra oomph out of them i want medium limbs so i wonder how that works like you know when you're shooting down what you mean like out of a tree stand like when you're angle like like that yeah because there's lots of times even with a cam as we just kind of got into mm -hmm. uh you know, there, there's, uh, it can hit off of stuff. I wonder how you would take a traditional bow. Oh, I know. It's, oh, I think it's, it's that angle. Like, I mean, you're, you're not shooting straight up and down. You're shooting because you want to keep it also on the shelf. You're shooting at like, uh, I wouldn't say 45 necessarily, but you're shooting with that bow on an angle. So it sits in that shelf. So there's no rest on it. No, it's just it's a bare shelf. shelf. Well, it is, um, Hoyt's got like a, a shelf spacer so that it centers the arrow on the shelf. Okay. Um, which I probably need to mess with that a little bit. And then it's got like, um, uh, I don't know, almost like not Velcro, but, but some sort of like fuzzy shelf kind of thing that helps your arrow sit in there, but doesn't cause any friction coming out. Right. Um, whisker biscuit. Yeah. Not a whisker, but not that stiff. Same, um, same, same, same. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, it's just going to take, you know, and I don't know. I, I mean, I won't, um, It'll be sometime. Yeah, just start the, messing with it. It'll be, I won't go, actually, the, probably the first place I'll hunt with it, if my schedule looks right, is going to be in Kentucky. I'm going to go try, I'll be in Kentucky for four or five days around the new year. Um, so if you're listening to this, maybe you see pictures of me killing. I, there's, you better get practicing. <laughs> I've been, uh, well, dude, I literally got it in the mail last night. I put it together. It took me 10 minutes to figure out how to string this thing. I haven't shot a recurve since I was 14, <laughs> you know? And then I'm like, is this right? Is this, I'm looking at the string. I'm like, is this thing long right, enough? Didn't you ever get a summer camp? No. That's, that's muscle memory for me. Str no. Stringing bows. No, I didn't get a summer camp. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, then got it all. At, and then like. You never went to a summer camp? No. Oh man. Sorry. No. <laughs> like heavyweights or. Uh, yeah, but you know, <laughs> just not, not for fat kids necessarily. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, I threw the block target out like 15 yards and like, I'd run out and set my security camera off. So the light would come on and then I'd run back mm -hmm, and shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many arrows you got? A dozen? Yeah. A dozen pre Speaking of that, it's the 20, I got to make arrows for dad for Christmas. Mm. So that's my gift. So yeah, I'm pretty stoked about that. Um, other, other than that, uh, I closed on a farm yesterday, bought a farm. Yeah, yesterday. Congrats. Uh, a lot of people have been asking if that's coming back. It is. Uh, Jared and I just have to work out some schedule stuff, but we are going to bring back the I Bought a Farm probably in 23, early 23, as we start getting back into habitat projects and things like that. And um, you and I are potentially looking at buying a farm together here in the not so distant future. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of are looking. Um, been looking. Been looking. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, like I said, it sucks that the season's kind of winding down. If you're in the South, which if you're listening to this podcast, you actually might be in the South. Um, it might be cranking uh, in your area. But for a lot of us in the Midwest and Northeast, it is winding down. So uh, that said, um, you know, I would say there's probably, mm, I won't put a number on it, handful of guys uh, in my background who like were, I would say mentors that I kind of looked up to when I was going through school for, for wildlife management and stuff. And, you know, we've had several of those guys on, uh, Bronson is obviously one of them. Bronson Strickland, uh, Craig Harper is another one. Um, I'm sure we'll have my professor, Steve Damaris on here at some point from Mississippi state. Dave Samuel is probably going to be on here soon. Uh, this guy though, uh, Dr. Carl Miller is our guest today from university of Georgia, Pennsylvania born, born and raised guy up in Elk County in the big woods. Um, and you know, uh, one of the guys much like Bronson and Craig, so here's what I love about these guys is that they're dear geniuses, right? Which you'll find out today. Carl's got a plethora of knowledge in multiple subjects, but they're hunters, right? I mean, like what they're doing has practicality to us as the general hunting public. Um, and, and that's no knock to some of these researchers who don't. But it's just hard, man. If you if you don't hunt and you don't understand the applicability of it, you could come up with some great research. But if it's not applicable to the general public who's out there doing the hunting and doing the management aspect of it, you know, it's cool in in, in literature. But uh, it's a lot cooler when somebody can actually take it and apply it practically to whatever they're doing. For sure. Um, and so you know, Carl's uh, research at the University of Georgia has covered deer vision. Uh, scrape communication, um, you know, different scent behaviors. I mean, it's it's just a long list of of big topics that I think are extremely important to us as as deer hunters and deer managers. And uh, yeah, be really cool to get him out here and and talk about it. Let's bring him in. Do we have you? Hey, what's up, man? Hey, you are. How goes it? Good. How are you? Doing great. So I think, you know, one of the things that we've heard a lot, at least on this podcast, just in response, um, and, you know, again, it's on a cyclic cycle too, but, you know, probably from your Southeastern disease cooperative down there is, you know, things are around EHD and then obviously chronic wasting disease being such a hot topic, um, you know, uh, in many states anymore, even in the South, you know, unfortunately in the last few years. Um, you know, is that something that, that you've seen in, in your kind of career there really pick up? I mean, there's probably always been different wildlife diseases that have come through and been studied out of that, that base, but, you know, especially maybe in the latter part of your career, just with, I, I don't know if it's just because people paid attention to EHD and things like that more, and then obviously more of the onslaught of, of chronic wasting. Uh, you know, EHD was actually the impetus for the development of the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study at the vet school at Georgia, hmm. because it was back in the days of restoration when they were restocking these deer herds, and then they were having these massive mortalities, you know, the deer drop, drop, dropping dead, and they called it uh, the disease X. They didn't kill her X. They didn't know, they didn't what, know it what it was. Huh. So that, that developed into the Southeastern Cooperative Disease Study, and they've done, you know, be between the, the scientists there, Stalnik and a bunch of others, they have done a tremendous amount of ide identification of you know, this disease. We probably know more about this disease than any other disease in white-tailed deer. Hmm. But it still continues to surprise us somewhat because of some of the expansion into the northern and western states uh, and how it's affecting herds up there compared to how it does in the southeast. You know, in southeast, it's more of a chronic thing. Yeah. They will have some every year. And you know, we, we lose some deer, but we don't lose, we don't have these massive die-offs like you would see up 
like we saw in the Midwest a couple a few years ago. Yeah. And you're starting to see some of the movement uh, northern areas as well, moving into Pennsylvania where you know it was unheard of before. We've, now it's there. Yeah, we've seen it at least two times probably in the last ten years, I would say. Pretty pretty stout here in the southwest corner of Pennsylvania. Right. And you know, what what is the what is the driver of that is probably related to the vector, the the, the noceum midge, the mm-hmm. little culicoides that may have might move north that was able to carry that that disease and spread that disease uh, you know we we haven't had the cold winters up north as we used to have as well yeah so, you know I, I i always don't like to get into the camp of global warming and all these sure. stuff, that controversy and stuff but you know we do know that things have moved further north right but then we also know that things have moved further south too we know the woodchucks have moved expanded their range to the south you know so is that global cooling cooling i think it's just that the habitat has changed and allowed uh, these, these organisms to move. I mean, I think it's one of those things that, you know, in, uh, it was probably the first time I was exposed to like an EHD, you know, outbreak was when I was in Mississippi at Mississippi state. And, you know, it was one of those things that uh, being from the North, right. I was completely oblivious to what this was. And, you know, to your point, it was, uh, more chronic than it was acute, but we did have, you know, pretty significant die offs in some of our research projects. in I think 20, 2007 maybe um but you know it's one of those things now where i think what people have such a tough time grasping is like literally in the midwest and northeast it could be on my farm but the farm across the street doesn't have any effect you know whatsoever like these just the way that this thing becomes so isolated and because it's usually you know more severe and acute in a lot of these midwest and northeast states i mean it's not like you're seeing sick deer i mean you're just finding them dead you know just piles of them Right, you know, because it's because it's episodic up there, they don't have any natural immunity to it. Mm-hmm. So deer that are deer that are born between the episodes, uh, they're pretty much immunologically naive to the, to the to the disease. Whereas down here, where it's more chronic, you know, they a lot of deer do carry some kind of titer for it. So it makes it you know less severe in many cases at a population level down here. So and, when yeah, but. So when those, when during those restocking efforts in the South, like I think Wisconsin was obviously a major source of that, you know, were they able to kind of uh, identify which of those restocking populations were being most effective by at that time disease X? I, um, no, I, I don't think there was actually what was even looked at. Right. To tell you, the truth. Hmm. And, you know, we, we have found some other diseases that have been traced back to the stocking sources, which is very interesting. Uh, these uh, cranial abscesses that uh, are pretty prolific in some areas down in Georgia, but that doesn't occur in other areas. It's related to a bacteria that all the deer carry, um, Truparella, Trupar, Truparella pyogenes. But there's where our deer in Georgia were restocked from Wisconsin. Most of them came from a place called the, the Sand Hills. I think it's called the Sand Hills Game Farm. Mm-hmm. And those deer tend to have, it, apparently what happened is they had a much more pathogenic strain of that bacteria that when a deer got injured, you know, what, by fighting or rubbing something around the base of the antlers, uh, it was much more pathogenic and led to a lot of these cranial abscesses. So we tracked that down. I had a graduate student working on his, uh, Brad Cohen worked on his PhD on this. And those areas where that were with stock with Wisconsin deer had a much higher prevalence of this disease than in other areas hmm. we're stocked with, you know, Georgia's been stocked for, you know, by a number of different states. And we then called uh, up at the Sand Hills game farm and said, do you guys have a high prevalence of this disease? And they said, yeah, we get it all the time up there. Really? So, you know, what's, what's, what's important. And, and, and I think that, you know, that's, that's kind of a cool thing, but the important take home from this, and it's related to CWD as well. When we move wildlife around the country, you move from one place to another place, you're not just moving that critter. You're moving mm-hmm. a whole biological package with that thing. Sure. All the parasites, all the disease, everything that that thing's in in, its, in in that range, you have just inoculated a deer herd potentially with some new stuff. And we know that that's a, the biggest way where CWD spreads because there's not a vector for CWD. Mm-hmm. You know, it's no, it's deer contact. Right. And you know, deer didn't jump from you know mid the Midwest of Pennsylvania. Yeah. They didn't fly there. Yeah. They got there in a truck. Right? Exactly. What what can be done, Carl? After these deer are like released into the wild, and <clears throat> maybe the the disease not isn't known that it's like hey, this is happening, but it's out there now. Is there anything that you can do to try to like address 
Um, with with that with that disease like the cranial abscess, no, you're just going to have a higher prevalence in that deer herd. Or, or EHD, for instance. I mean, is there has there been any attempts to like mitigate that disease anywhere in the country? Or yeah, you know, the deer farming industry has done some work on that, particularly related to the vector of it. Um, you know, to to keep the vector, the Aculacoides vector down. You know, using certain types of insecticides and so forth. Uh, okay. We did it in Mississippi State. I literally Emily and I would drive around with a ultra low volume fogger in the back of a side by side, spraying uh, what permethrin, you know, some mm-hmm. some deleted, and like we would fog the pens basically every evening. Now whether that actually had a landscape level effect, probably not. But the goal was to have some sort of localized effect on that. There's right. Probably- you're not you're not going to do anything to a deer herd. Exactly. So. No. I'm sure it's been like a, to- a topic of conversation am- amongst like, you know, your guys as far as uh, distributing medicine, essentially, is the way like vaccinating a deer herd, essentially, like in a, in a certain sense. I- I'm sure it's been discussed about how-, how would we do that? Or I've even thought like on our farm about, you know, we see all th- these ticks hanging off of them and we think, oh, it has to have an effect on, you know, their antler growth and stuff like that. So I can't be the first mm-hmm. person that's thought of like, hey, man, how do we? How do we apply medicine to a, a wild deer herd? Yeah, you, you, you actually covered two different topics there. One of them is actually using something like an, a vaccination, which works for certain diseases, versus an insecticide or a caricide, sure. which would work for ticks. Sure. And that you know each, each one, there's ways of dealing with that type of stuff. It'd be extremely once if we ever did get a vaccine for it. The question is then how do you get it out in right in, right in the field? You know we've done that with rabies vaccine. We inundate places with rabies. Uh, uh, vaccination pellets to to try to control rabies that way. Uh, could we do it with whitetail? You know, if it's not if it's not a human health concern, I wonder whether they would put the money into it. First of all, but first we aren't there yet. Mm-hmm. We don't have a we don't have a vaccine for CWD, and we may never have one for CWD. Right. We've had a, we've had some limited success with some of the work uh, that we were associated with that was done at Colorado State with a vaccine, but that was very limited success. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things I think of, like when you talked about that cranial abscess piece of it, Carl, is like, I, I don't know when it was, maybe when it was in the South, you know, at some point along the lines there it was kind of the, you know, average expectancy was like whatever, 10% of your mature bucks to die from some sort of natural mortality. And, and it seemed like that cranial abscess, uh, especially in herds where you had a more balanced age structure or an older age structure in there just became more prevalent. But are you saying that you don't think that you would see that in some of the Midwestern, North, uh, Northeastern states as much if you had an older age structure? Uh, certainly not. You, you generally don't even really see it much in Texas. Interesting. You know, so, you know, it has it has more to do with the, the and we actually looked at the pathogenicity of this, this strain of bacteria. So uh, hmm. it's it's related to that, that, it, that population. Really? And we, so we got a population up north and we got a population here in Georgia and um, Eastern Shore of Maryland. There's a high incidence of it as well. Uh, Remington Farms there. So, you know, and you're right, it's about 10 percent. But not all deer die from this thing. So a lot of times deer get these cranial abscesses and you end up with a malformed antler because it actually, you know, causes right. a different abscission layer at the pedicle. And you have an abnormal antler bud at that time. And then you get an abnormal antler and that will you know, that deer will survive, but its trophy value has just been eliminated too, right? Yeah. Unless it, unless it gets a really cool antler there. Right. Which normally it's not. It's a big cow horn. <laughs> right. It's, it's something strange. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Cause like, you know, I know that there's a lot of people that, um, you know, it's always the what ifs, you know, if I, if I'm managing a piece of property, you always have the what ifs of, uh, this buck disappeared and I never saw him again. And we've even talked about some instances this year where uh, I'll give you an example, Carl, behind my house, it's 30 some acres. Um, I had this really mature buck show up in late October this year. Um, and I go back through my, my photos and i I'm not 100% sure, but I would say 95% sure I have that deer as either a two or three year old in 2017 on my property. Um, Hmm. And I would have said in 2018 that deer was dead, right? He didn't show back up. It's Pennsylvania. There's pressure around like he got shot. Um, But sure as heck, it seems like that deer somehow just survived, which we talk about all the time. Like these bucks got nothing else to do but survive, right? Breed and survive. That's about it. Um, And, you know, it seems like he makes it through. And I think a lot of people would be 
you know, either writing a deer off quickly to whether it's deer vehicle collisions, uh, number one is somebody else shot them, um, or the, the potential of a natural mortality. Um, but sometimes I think these deer just move, like they just change their, their home range and their core area and they move and eventually they find their way back. Yeah, I, I think, you know, some of the work that's been done that we did at Georgia and actually some of the, one of the studies we did at up in Pennsylvania in the big woods up there, we had some radio calls on some mature bucks up there. But we had some studies that, you know, all across the southeast and Mississippi State has done some of the very similar work as well, uh, looking at the movements of these mature bucks. And there's a certain percentage of these mature bucks that have home have bimodal home ranges, spring, summer home ranges, and then they have breeding winter ranges. And we had one buck in Louisiana that traveled between its home, summer home range and his breeding range. And I forget what date it was, like October 3rd or something like that. Uh, he just picked up and moved uh, five miles straight line distance, settled down into his, his uh, breeding range. That's Came wild. back that following March. The next year, he moved on the exact same day again. Hmm. And I, I don't know how he did that, whether it was probably just fortuitous that it was because right. you know, they don't carry a calendar. But, you know, it was the exact same date and he went to the exact same location. Hmm. So we know there's a fairly major shift going on on these deer herds uh, in the, in, you know, we know deer, the bucks change their movement patterns in response to the rut. But there is some there's some shifts in these animals that go to an, maybe an ancestral rutting area, uh, someplace that they are much more familiar with which has some pretty important implications for doing a September camera survey, right? Exactly. That's what I was going to say. I mean, you survey a entire population that, you know, who knows how much percent of that is actually going to exist in that same area come the time you're actually holding the weapon in your hand. We just had a paper published uh, based on some, some camera survey data where we use both uh, active cameras and passive cameras uh, on a couple 3000 acre properties. And, uh, James Johnson got it. That was part of his PhD work that just we just got that published just a couple couple days ago. Anyways, that there was a tremendous shift in the buck population across that land, 3,000 acre landscape. Hmm. So that if you had, you know, if, if we broke it up and you had one corner was for your hunting lease, it was 300 acres out of that 3,000. In September, you would have thought, oh my God, look at all the bucks we've got here. Yeah. But by the time the rut rolled around, they weren't there anymore. So what happened to the, you know, those guys are thinking those bucks just disappeared. Yeah. You know, those bucks just moved versus this other guys over here that had their, their, um, their trail cameras were their ca camera survey was telling them, well, we got a lot of does, but we don't really have any bucks. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, yeah, bang, boom. you know, where did these deer come from? And, and is how it, often do you hear that when people are hunting? They say, oh, I had no clue that deer was in the area. All the well, time. he wasn't. Yeah wasn't in the area. He was a newbie. Is that a, are, are you associating that purely to a breeding draw versus food or anything else? It, and, you know, it can be both. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously it, uh, it can be driven by food, you know, an egg, egg field that's, that's harvested is not going right. to be much of a draw anymore. Right. Right. Or you, know, you go up in the big woods of Pennsylvania, the North, you know, you, you go into a, a South slope where you got a bunch of oaks mm -hmm. and, where are they going to be in the fall if the acorns are dropping? Yeah, on that top. They'll, they'll be there. They're they're yep. going to shift to that food resource until the till the peak of the rut kicks in. Mm -hmm. Does it seem so like that? Food, food is going to drive it, but you're just just changes in their behavior is going to drive it as well. These bucks just move. Mm -hmm. Some of them. Does it seem like it happens more or less in certain types of habitat? No, because um, I work with uh, the guys at Texas A and M down at Kingsville as well, and even in South Texas it works this way. The different bucks have different breeding strategies. And here's, here's the thing to think about. A deer is not a deer is not a deer. Yeah. Deer are not all created equal. Mm -hmm. They have different deer analogies, right? Mm -hmm. They behave differently. Because if all deer behave the same way, they'd make it real easy on a predator to try to, you know, yeah. be in on certain types of behaviors. So deer are very adaptive behaviorally. Uh, to, you know, so that's what you would expect to see is a lot of different behaviors. You know, in South Texas, in that study down there, that was related to looking at different breeding strategies. And some bucks have, you know, and this even harkens back to some real early work that was done by a guy by the name of Bennett in South Texas, where he classified bucks as different categories. Mm -hmm. And he had one group called the dominant floaters. And these are the big bucks that decide they're going to go wherever the heck they wanted to go when the rut came in. Mm -hmm. But there are also other bucks out there that become much more sedentary. We found bucks that would hang out at a feeder. 
mm-hmm. waiting for the does to come to them instead of going out looking for does. We've talked about that. Oh, corn tooth. And mm-hmm. then, and then, and then there's some travelers, you know, that, that, that make their rounds from place to place to place. Yeah. So it depends on the strategy. Some deer are much more aggressive. Some deer are much more passive. You know, the aggressive ones may end up having higher breeding success, but they may get dead easier too. Sure. So, mm-hmm. you, you know, it's a, it's a risk and trade off thing that a deer are working through on. I mean, even outside of the rut, I know. So most of my hunting is in like the farmland of Ohio. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, it just seems like a, a constant transition from honestly, the entire like five or six months that, that we're monitoring, like with trail cams, like the bucks that we have in July, typically we'll see kind of through September. And then we'll have a, a group of bucks that show up like kind of for October, like October through mid-October. So that's like your, your hard horn October bucks. Mm-hmm. And then even those bucks seem to to kind of disappear come mid-October. We seem to see another shift into like you're your really your rutting, which goes all the way through the end of December. And then towards, right. towards the end of December, we start to see really hard shifts towards remaining food because most of the, the stuff's been cut. Um, so it's kind of like constant, like throughout the season, you've got new bucks <clears throat> showing up and, and also disappearing, you know, so we're kind of having to like look back and say, okay, you know, this buck is, hopefully he'll show up around the 1st of October, but likely he's going to leave again, you know, or early or, or mid in October. And so we're having to be mm-hmm. kind of like, <laughs> uh, yeah. trying to predict who, who's going to show up and who's going to leave and, and, you know, the window of opportunities we're going to have to hunt them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting also when you, you a lot of places have, you know, a couple hundred acres to hunt or your, their, their lease is a couple hundred acres, 300, 400 acres, and they do all this habitat work and they're not finding the success of getting the mature bucks. Yeah. What that speaks to is the importance of working with your neighbors as well. You know, and I think that's these, the big part, Carl, is you've got tons of people, including myself, listening to this thing and saying, you know, I'm a like I'm a full year you know, management guy, like I'll be cutting at some point here in the next few months and then I'll have spring food plots in. And then, you know, in some cases, if I'm in an area with no ag, I'll put summer plots in, but then you have to question all that to say, you know, is that really, cause all it comes down to is depending on the state, but let's say September, October, November, December, and that's it. Like if the bucks aren't there in those four months, that's great that I had, you know, two booners running around in August, but if they never are on my property from opening day of the season till the end of the season, like almost what good is that for me? Yeah. And you know, what, what the goal then is, is, you know, how do we keep, how do you keep them there? Yeah. And, you know, I, th- I think a lot of people underestimate the importance of having sanctuary areas, you know, mm-hmm. places where pe- these deer are just not disturbed. They learn that, you know, they, they, they know, you know, how many times have you heard of a really big mature buck being killed in a place where nobody would ever conceive of hunting for that mature buck? Yeah. Well, he got big and mature because he did something different, but he wasn't disturbed there as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that allowed him to get older. You know, this 10-year-old kid that killed one behind the barn. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. No, I think that makes sense. I mean, it, that's where I think a lot of people, you know, and there, there obviously are plenty of consultants out there that'll throw different stories at you of, what to do, don't plant summer plots, do plant summer plots, you know, only focus on, you know, green fields, you know, make sure you're doing cuts, whatever. And, you know, I think that that's where like in today's society of how much information is being thrown around out there on the internet, it's like, you know, no wonder most of these people who own property and are trying to do something and have their heads spinning. Yeah. You know, and they're also the ones that are riding around on their, or on their four wheelers or, or their, their side by sides, you know, and For sure. taking walks in the woods, doing all kinds of stuff, disturbing those woods, you know, deer can get used to disturbance, mm-hmm. but if they have a place where they're not going to get disturbed at all, where are they going to, where are they going to camp out? Here's mm-hmm. an example. I've got a neighbor just across a dirt road. I live on a dirt road out in a very rural area and he's got 300 acres over there that he does not go on there during the, the off season, maybe, maybe to plant a food plot, but it's, it's a no go zone. And when he does go on, he's the only one that will hunt it. And when he does go on there, he watches the wind and he's very careful about that. So, I mean, this is a, this is 300 acres of sanctuary and he doesn't shoot anything any, you know, unless it's a really mature buck and he's killed some nice bucks over there. And he had one of them better than 160 class. Wow. And I never had any of those bucks on camera just across the dirt road. Hmm. They they never they probably never left his place. Yeah, 
Be- and I think that, that yeah. well, and that's the hard part. I mean, if you you know, for most of us, we buy a piece of land, right? It, it to to then have to say, well, okay, now that you bought it, don't use it, <laughs> right? I mean, that's literally what we're we're trying to. <laughs> that you're advising is like, Hey, great. You bought that 250 acres. That's all. Don't use it. <laughs> like don't go on it. That, that is the hard way. Well, it's not saying don't use it. Don't use the port. A port exactly. It. Yeah. Right. Well, how big do you think that part has to be? Does it depend on the area? I, I don't, you know, it depends on how much co- I would, I would guess it would depend on how much cover is there. Yeah. But you know, I've, I've got one little patch in uh, down over the hill behind my house. That's only about an acre in size. And I know bucks go in there in bed because it's a real thick, it's a thicket of sweet gum and briars and everything else like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the number of times that, you know, my dog has jumped a deer out of there or something like that. That's, that was a, that's little sanctuary. Yeah. But, you know, 20 acres, I think could have a very major influence on holding deer on a property, holding that, bucks on a property. That's the one thing I think we continue to go back and forth on is, you know, obviously trying to, you know, hold a buck on the property. In fact, you know, again, going back to the huntability of them, you know, really, I just need him to be there during the daylight. I don't really care where he goes at nighttime, right? Uh, you know, I want to hold him during those daylight hours. And, and I think that people start to look at that and say, okay, if I've got 200 acres and I need to try to create a 20 acre sanctuary, you know, the question comes is if I'm trying to kill a mature buck, could I have multiple mature bucks bedding in a 20 acre sanctuary? I don't see why not, because those mature bucks would already have set up their dominance hierarchy. Yep. They would have known who is who. Yeah. So you, you, obviously, you're not going to have too many mature bucks, because if the, the one that's subordinate is going to go find someplace off the property where he can be dominant, right? Sure. So, and so, so it's going to depend on the landscape context and what the neighbors have out there as well. If he goes across the property line, he finds another dominant buck over there, he might just say, oh, well, I'm, I'm stuck, right? It definitely seems like we see that a lot is, you know, cause we'll have bucks that make it. We're, we're pretty confident. Like we'll find sheds or whatever. And then mm-hmm. maybe they're there in the summer, but then they'll, they'll move off, you know, bucks that were there, you know, throughout the year, the year before. Um, seems like there's a lot about like the social dynamic of, of these bucks that, you know, may, maybe we don't quite understand. Well, that's, we that's talk about, that. yeah, we talk about the social stress often on, on a herd. And especially when you talk about mature bucks and, you know, that's probably one of the least things that we understand, I would say about. And maybe it's not just deer. between bucks, you know, it's the, it's the does as well. Like I know, I know mm-hmm. we have a lot of does on our property, arguably too many for what the, the bedding habitat can sustain. Um, but, but we still have good bucks I mean, good genetic bucks, good, you know, t- two, three year old bucks that, um, you know, seem, seem to just move off and, and they do show up, you know, to be on the next mm-hmm. property over. And uh, we never really could explain that, whether it's, it's pressure or we don't have the right food or uh, uh, too many deer. In I would area. argue there is a, there's a social dynamic causing that as well. I don't think there's any question. And uh, your point, Jeremy, this is, this is one aspect of deer that given the advent of GPS colors, we're starting to be able to tease some of this stuff out. Sure. Uh, uh, it's, we're, and with GPS color, we're finding, you know, there's a lot more dynamics to a deer population than we used to think there was. And they, they're, you know, they're, they're much more dynamic in their movements across the landscape and how deer diff- utilize different habitats, uh, how much they actually do move. Mm-hmm. You know, with this whole idea of, of buck, these excursions that these bucks make in the springtime, we yeah. never knew about any of that stuff before. We don't know why they still why they do it, but you know they can take off for a day, two, or up to a week, and just go walk about for you know a while, and then turn, return right back to their home range and never leave again. Yeah, and I'm yeah. So because I mean, what are, maybe they're they're scouting an area, you know, per se to to find a, a spot where if they lose their dominant area, they can. That's another alternative, right? A backup plan type of thing. But yeah. It may, it may be, you know, they did test it out. Maybe they just went, wanted to find a new place and they walked for about six or eight miles and said, Hey, it's not getting any better. I just had a good enough at home. I just going back home. That's know? like Jared, when he was looking for a new spot in Allegheny national forest, he walked seven miles and ended up back in the same tree stand. <laughs> <laughs> same difference. Yeah. yeah. It, it's hard to explain though. I mean, where some of these deer turn up, it's like, you know, arguably I, I would say not as good a habitat, you know, and, to your, to your comment about these small landowners that have done all this habitat work, you know, they're probably thinking I've done all this work. Like, how is it possible that these, why would they leave? Um, mm-hmm. and, and yet they do, you know, again, we're back to, I don't know if it's the social dynamic between the deer or, or, you know, pressure that's being put on them directly or indirectly with just being on the farm and stuff, but it's hard to make sense of sometimes, you know, wh- why these deer leave. Mm-hmm. 
so we got off on a tangent here that we weren't in- anticipating going on. <laughs> well, no, it's good. I mean, that's the, the, it's the entire point of the podcast, right? We end up finding a rabbit hole and it's, it's, um, you know, the one thing that I think is so interesting, Carl, and obviously, you know, you, origins are Pennsylvania, but you know, it seems like anymore when, at least around Jared and I, when people talk about whitetail deer or whitetail deer hunting, like the Midwest is the Mecca and it, for some reason, and we had this conversation not too long ago, it's just like, man, I feel like the, the South has been so advanced in so much that they've done, but for some reason, and I don't know if it's just because they're not producing the caliber of bucks that you see in Iowa and Kansas and stuff, but it just seems like the South doesn't get the acknowledgement um, from a from a deer management or a deer int- uh, interest or research side as some of those states where it's like, oh, that's Iowa. You know, they produce booners all the time. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a bunch of different things going on there. And, and uh, you know, some of the South, you know, you look at Kentucky, Kentucky does really well. You know, we, we'll claim that as part of the South. Uh, yeah. And you, I don't know if you've ever looked at the, uh, the Boone and Crockett map of Georgia versus, you know, the Southeast versus the Midwest. Yeah. You know, everything's red out in the Midwest and up in Wisconsin and so forth. And you look at Georgia and Georgia kind of stands out in the Southeast, sure. but there's quite a few of those counties colored in as well. Yeah. But uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is those are the number of buck, uh, Boone and Crockett bucks that were killed on a county basis, just an absolute count. Yeah. And if you look at the county sizes of Georgia versus the county sizes of, you know, Wisconsin or some of those others, it's maybe half or a third. Really? So, you know, if you actually looked at a deer uh, Boone and Crockett per unit area yeah. per square mile, uh, you know, Georgia would, ha- would stand out a lot better because Georgia is one of the southeastern states, particularly in the southwestern part of the state where we've got some really good sur- soils. We've got some good quality agriculture there, and that's producing a lot of good quality bucks, hmm. you know. What drives the, the 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 number of Boone and Crockett's? I you know just you know what drives antler development, right? Right. Age. Yeah. They got to get the age first, and in many places in the southeast, we have high hunter densities, and you know now our age structure is much much better than it was 20 years ago. You've got pretty uh, liberal bag limits too. Yeah, we got liberal bag limits, and but you know dirt drives it yeah. more than anything. Yeah. And the high quality dirt we have agriculture in areas where we got good quality dirt, so. You're doubling up there. You've got a lot of agriculture mm-hmm. that's also there because it's got good quality dirt, which also means that, that, that it's producing a lot of other vegetation out there that's good quality. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a win-win situation for deer. You can actually look at the, 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 the soil productivity factor and you can plot out that same map of Boone and Crockett. Yeah. Just that, follows it. You know, the, the dirt drives it. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, one thing's a little bit different is South Texas. That dirt, dirt is not as good a quality down there as it would be in the Midwest, obviously. Right. But one thing, one thing they have is age and they've got lots of age. Um, but also that's a soil that's, uh, it's not really leached out because of, you know, their, their low rainfall levels. So it withholds a lot of minerals, particularly calcium, phosphorus, and other things that are important for antler growth. So you've got smaller deer in South Texas, but you've got bigger antlers per unit, you per body, per body size of those deer. Right. And some <laughs> of the biggest deer in South Texas, you know, maybe 150 pounds, but they're sporting, some really nice antlers on them, right? Yeah. And I think that's what, you know, from a management level, when I moved from Pennsylvania to the South, that was probably the first thing that I looked at. And not even just from a, from a wildlife management area, just, you know, pine plantations and timber cuts and everything that they had done in the South. It just seemed so much more intense from where I came from. Um, so it wasn't too surprising that, you know, people were killing at least, older bucks, you know, and, and in some cases, you know, just as good antler quality. I mean, when I was in the Mississippi Delta, I mean, we were obviously in bucks that were 250 pounds getting killed left and right. You know, I mean, there were mm-hmm. stuff, there was no different of those deer to me than, you know, some of these deer in Iowa and Wisconsin. Right. Um, and that's all in the Mississippi Delta, good, good, dirty. Good, thing, yeah, know? exactly. So I think that's where, you know, for whatever reason it kind of, and you know, I'm sure hunters in the South don't mind it. You know, they're, they're kind of like, yeah, that's fine. You know, stay up in Wisconsin, stay up you know, North, um, you know, leave it, leave it be down here. And it is, it's, it's a lot different hunting. Um, sure. You've got some hardwood bottoms and ridges and things like that, but man, you get into some of these like pine plantation type places and stuff. I mean, it's, it's not, e- it's, if you're from the Midwest or Northeast, it's not an easy adaptation to go and, and hunt in the South. <laughs> 
That, that, that's absolutely true. It's easy to pattern a deer in the Midwest, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, when, when you, when you got stringers and, you know, wood lines and stuff, yep. you know, throughout a lot of the country, it's, you know, where deer are, their movements are condensed in some way. You know, a lot of places in the South, they're not, they're different habitats. You got pond stands, you got harvest stands, bottoms and so forth, but you know, deer are us- utilizing all those stands. Yeah. So, the Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Dude, where would we be without our Hoyt bows? Probably shooting crossbows. <laughs> or, or a Matthews. Yeah. <laughs> One in the same. Yeah. But in all seriousness, we love being Hoyt guys because you stand out. When you're in this room full of other people that shoot these other types of bows, I feel like the Hoyt guys just stick out. Uh, dude, it's just a legit bow. I mean, th- th- especially that carbon riser, man. I mean, I-, I know that they've got several other aluminum lines as well. But for, for me, I'm shooting that RX-5 uh, in the carbon model. They've since come out with the RX-7. And uh, I can't tell you how much I love being a Hoyt guy amongst a C4 of Matthews guys. So we're out there, I think, pr- proving them wrong, shooting 80 pounds and uh, you know, killing stuff. Hey, man, if you want to get serious, get Hoyt. I want to I want to touch on vision here in a second, Carl. But one thing that um, I saw the other day, and I don't know if I think Bronson probably put it out on Mississippi State's thing. I'm not sure if you saw it, but they they had surveyed basically um, I don't know a specific population of Mississippi, and they were looking at the frequency of scrape use. I think from different age class of bucks. Do you happen to see that one that they put out? Yeah. Um, and so, and I think. I'm assuming Bronson did it, but, you know, I think he openly admitted that, you know, that, um, particular herd that, that they were probably surveying was younger than, you know, having a more, uh, older age class kind of balance there. But, you know, it still seemed very, uh, apparent that I think maybe it was two and three year olds or two year olds, especially were like the overwhelming majority of, of scrape use, um, in that population. And, you know, I know, I think you guys have done some scrape research in Georgia and, and, you know, I think that's one thing people, I don't know if they are over hunting scrapes or overconfident about hunting scrapes, but in terms of, you know, you get that mature buck on a scrape and you just kind of want to believe that he's going to come back to that thing frequently. And at least per their research, doesn't seem like that's the case. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a couple aspects of that, that, you know, that scrape research could be a whole podcast in itself. Um, that was actually what I did some of my dissertation work on is looking at, you know, bucks of scrapes and who was making the scrapes. And at one time we thought it was just the dominant buck in an area made a scrape and, and all the other ones were just stayed away from it. Well, we've since learned a lot, since, you know, that that's not necessarily the case. And any individual scrape could be used by a number of bucks. Mm-hmm. Back in the 80s, uh, a couple of my graduate students, uh, Karen Alexi and jo- Jonathan Gatha, were, were, doing, were putting up motion sensor video cameras over some of these scrapes this was before the day was when you could buy those things we actually oh, yeah. made our own you know <laughs> and, and you had to print out the film right you got to get to the kmart and get it developed or whatever oh yeah we had we had actual video cameras in those things in, in, a, Holy in, a, five cow. Gallon, wow. in a five gallon bucket <laughs> <laughs> wow. so that's how old this research was <laughs> but we we put them out over what we would consider was going to be scrape sites at some point yep and we were really surprised what we found is, you know, we we had as many as 13, 14 different bucks come into these any individual scrape, you know, so these animals are using it. We found bucks using multiple scrapes. We found uh, scrapes that were no more than 200 yards apart. The different groups of bucks were using those different scrapes. You know, there's a whole different whole dynamic going on with the scrape youth as, as well. And we actually had some mature bucks killed within sight of our cameras that we never got on those cameras on those scrapes. Why mm. did they come to those scrapes, you know? Mm. And I think you gotta be careful sometimes when you're doing some of this research, when it's looking at who's using those scrapes, there's certain ones that will come in and work that branch, yep. you know, and that branch is used year round in many cases, um, you know, pot and leave, leave the urine spot there. But some bucks may just check those scrapes, just wind them and go on. I think that's actually, the thing that most people fail. I mean, because we talk about it all the time, especially now with cell cameras, like how uh, dependent we are on that information that's being passed directly to our phone, basically in real time. And if it, if that buck's not hitting that scrape and your stands on it, you're just like, well, he's not there, so I'm not hunting it. You know, right? And he might be behind the camera. Yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. Yeah, and the other thing we found is that you know, not surprisingly, that over ninety percent of scrape use was at nighttime. Hmm. Yeah. You know, so hunt, hunting scrapes, you know, back in the 80s, hunting scrapes became the big thing. And you, 
had all these outdoor writers coming up with things like territorial scrapes and boundary scrapes and breeding scrapes. And they had all these different types of scrapes. And I think these bucks are out there going through their playbook. Okay. What do I need to do here to what kind of scrape should I build here? You know, yeah. you know, bucks are just, all they're doing is leaving a calling card that indicates their presence in their absence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. And I think, it, you know, we've always tried to say, okay, uh, maybe it's playing a weather condition, like an October front. And we're like, all right, that buck's been hitting this scrape. This front's coming through. Like he, there's a good chance. And I mean, you know, per, per that, I mean, maybe he hits it, maybe he doesn't. I mean, is there data that uh, says fr- like frequency? I, I know you're saying 90% of it is at night, but like in a, in a concentrated time frame of, let's say, you know, the last two weeks in October, how many times a certain buck will hit a hit a scrape or how many scrapes they're hitting or anything so like that? Typically you get your, your, your peak scraping activity is going to occur in a deer herd two weeks in advance of the peak of the rut. Mm-hmm. So if you have all of a sudden you just have this explosion of scrapes, generally it's going to be sometime in most areas around the end of October. Mm-hmm. And you can pretty much count on the rut, the peak of the rut falling about two weeks later. That's when most of the does will come into estrus. And there's, very likely some communication, some chemical communication going on between the bucks and the does that's, you know, synch- you know, synchronizing estrus and synchronizing readiness in these bucks. You know, Mother Nature's by design wants all those fawns to be born at the same time to swamp the predators, right? That's right. So Mother Nature wants a very concentrated rut so you have a very concentrated fawning period. And the best way to concentrate that rut is first is driven by photo period. Mm-hmm. But even within those photo periods, there's a, there's, there's, you know, opportunity for for leeway there so the behaviors of the animals synchronize each other as well Hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting yeah because i mean one of the things that and i don't know if it was this year more than others but um i think both of us had several you know older bucks maybe three four five years old that basically just bedded down by scrapes like they're just waiting waiting for Mm -hmm. a doe to show up (laughs) Basically. Okay, here, here it comes back to that same thing we were talking about earlier, the different deer, deer analogies out yeah. there. And that will be a strategy of some bucks, mm-hmm. but other bucks, you know, they'll say, I'm not going to worry about the scrapes. I'm going to go find me a doe, right? Yeah. Well, and, and I, that, I think it's interesting, especially the mature buck side, you know, and again, advent of, of cell cameras and things like that have, have, you know, brought in so much more observation data, you know, and, and to each its own <clears> with some bias, but you know, I think what's really unique is you start playing back in your head and like rarely, rarely do I see a five-year-old buck like bolting through the woods, full chase on a doe, right? It just seems like I see him, he's just already with her. Like he just has her, you know, whereas like the three-year-old or something, yeah, I'm seeing full chases. Like, I mean, he's wearing himself out. He's, he's dog and does, but I just <laughs> yeah. think about this in terms of humans, you know, Oh, I think know. About a college guy versus a 40 year old man. That's you know, exactly one? what it seems like. But it also <laughs> seems like for whatever reason, and I don't know if it's, it's, um, call it the doe being submissive or whatever, but it just seems like those bigger bucks, especially this past year, I know yeah. I just, they would just be with a, a doe and I never saw him chasing, you know, I did see him work in scrapes, but it just seemed like they, you know, whether the doe found them or they found the doe, well, they, they just didn't work as hard as some of these other deer. They're, they're sitting They're, they're, they're and probably waiting. much more, much more polite, know how to treat a lady. There you go. And, That's very possible. And these, and these younger, these younger bucks are out there. They just, they want to get it done and go on. Yeah, right? They're just nosing. <laughs> they're just nosing. <laughs> I don't know if it has anything to do with politeness. I think they're, they're just smart enough to know that they sit and wait. It's not just on scrapes either. You'll see it at corn food. piles, food plots, bedding areas, trail intersections. Yeah. Always... Uh, and you, you can see it in the rut too. You know, you see these young bucks become much more mobile earlier. Oh yeah. Before the peak of the rut, you know, you got a week or two of all of a sudden the activity is starting to pick up, but it's all these young guys, you yeah. know, you know, just take your time and wait because it, the, the, the other guys will be out when, when the time's yeah, right. Yeah. They know when it's right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, you've heard, we've heard a lot of people, especially as you're approaching you know the right time that they're just like hey you know i know that this is where the does are and i know he's just gonna probably at some point mosey down in here and just say which one's ready you know and that's just yeah. kind of how he is okay here's, here's another thing to think about though uh those bucks that are young at two and a half and three and a half that are real aggressive on these does that are chasing these does yep also probably have a higher mortality rate than the ones that don't do that Mm-hmm. So the ones that, that that don't do that, the ones that are kind of slower, more with you know more po- more polite, we can yeah. say, those are the ones that live longer. So it's not maybe maybe it's not that they change between two and a half and four and a half, 
Mm-hmm. Maybe that's the, the ones that survived or there's just a higher percentage of those that survived at four and a half that act like that. And so or that's ju- that's just your personality, basically, not necessarily yeah. anything to do with age. Yeah. Well, and I think it's probably a little bit of both. OK. Hmm. It's just probably I mean, per- pers- personalities do change with age, too. You know, sure. You're, yeah. You're not the same guy you were at 19. No, I'm not. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, you see that a lot, especially you know, getting towards the end of the rut, you know, they start to figure out that the does are, Mm -hmm. are coming to a certain area. Mm -hmm. And and so they'll, a lot right now, if you see them just, they'll come out and bed on the edge of like a food plot and they'll just wait and watch. Sure. And then when something comes out, they'll get up and go check it out. And go back. If it's nothing, they'll go back and Mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. Picture that compared to a yearling buck walking out in a scrape where he chases everything. Oh yeah. Walking out in the field, chases everything that's out there to see if anything will stand. Absolutely. Burning energy. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah, well, and again, I think those big bucks just realize that, you know, they just need to survive. That's what they got to focus on. You know, breeding's good, and then survival. Mm-hmm. That's it. Um, all right, let's 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 talk kind of the big topic, uh, even though it got derailed a little bit. So the deer vision side, I think, is something, you know, obviously a lot more research, especially from you guys um, out there on deer vision. But I would say from probably a general hunting standpoint, deer hunting standpoint, most people are com- just completely oblivious to um, deer vision capabilities. You know, whether we're talking rods and cones and, and low light conditions and stuff, or even on the color spectrums. Um, yeah, I think, and it, it you can see that in, um, call it the camo side of things, right? And this isn't to knock any different pattern one from the other, but, you know, uh, look at all of the different patterns that we have out in the hunting industry and on market. Um, you've got some that are more open based and kind of break up. You've got other ones that are more, it looks like a, a tree, right? I mean, that's what it's trying to mimic a tree or a branch or whatever. Um, it maybe it, I know this has evolved a lot since, um, since Gino's research, which what would that have been? 2000s for Gino? Yeah, it was, it, it's, it's been a while. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe just kind of chime us in on some of the, even the more recent stuff that you guys have started to find there, because I think it would open, no pun intended, the eyes of, of more people listening to this thing, um, from a deer vision, because we talk about breakup, we talk about concealment, we talk about, you know, uh, stand placement and all of these things are so critical. And yet, um, they're all based on deer vision, which we probably don't have as good of a grasp on. Yeah, and you know, a couple of things to say in prelude to that is, you know, so many hunters are always concerned about, you know, there's 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 scent, yes, and and scent minimization, but they'll stand up and in their stand they'll fidget and stuff like that and wear wear the wrong camo or something like that as well. They don't they don't understand the importance of vision for deer. Mm-hmm. Remember what deer do? Deer do one of three things, and everything in their brain is revolves around those three things, those three questions that they ask themselves every day. How am I going to uh, what am I going to have for lunch? How am I going to keep from being lunch? And how am I going to make another one of me? Which means how do you how do I exist in a social environment and, and you know related to breeding and so forth? Mm-hmm. So all their senses revolve around that as well. We have a very different you know what we do with our senses is very different than what deer do with their senses. And our 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 different senses, particularly our sense of vision, is highly adapted for what we do but it would be very, very bad for a deer. You know, if we had deer's eyes, you know, we couldn't do what we do. And if deer had our eyes, they couldn't do what they do. Mm-hmm. Their eyes work for them for those three reasons. Mm-hmm. How do I avoid predation? A little bit about how they find something to eat, but that's not very important for them. But how do they move through the woods? And some in communication as well. But probably the most important thing for deer's vision is predator avoidance. Mm-hmm. Because they need to detect a predator before they become a prey. Mm-hmm. So if we look at that in context of, you know, a deer's eyes, we can start to see why a deer's eyes are the way they are. And they are actually very different. When a deer's walking through the woods, it sees a very different world than we see. Very different. And most hunters don't appreciate that. They, th- they say, well, are our deer's eyes better than ours or worse than ours? Well, the answer is yes to both. Mm-hmm. You know, so you want to we can go through a kind of a, a, a se- sequence of differences between our eyes and the deer's eyes and we can talk about some of the importance of them as far as the deer is concerned yeah so first of all one you know just starting with very general looking at the anatomy of a deer and the anatomy of a human our eyes are located on the front of our face very close together which gives us very good binocular vision but really terrible peripheral vision mm-hmm. deer's eyes are on the side of their head 
and the, the, which gives them tremendous peripheral vision, but a little less with as far as binocular vision. We generally see in a span of about, you know, with our peripheral vision, maybe about 160 total, if we're looking straight ahead or the, the degree of angle, mm-hmm. deer would probably be around 300, maybe 310. Wow. So there's only a you know, very small, you know, 40, 50 degree angle blind spot behind a deer. Mm-hmm. There is a blind spot, but it's very small. So a deer, when it's looking at something off in the distance and you're on its side, it can see you just as well as when it's looking forward. Mm-hmm their peripheral vision. And we'll talk about why that is because their peripheral vision is much better than ours. Okay. That's one aspect of it. Now, if you ever looked in the eyes of a deer in the, you know, a live deer in the daytime, it doesn't look like a lot of, a lot of time the eyes you see in a mounted deer, Mm -hmm. because if you look at their pupil, their pupil is more of an oval or almost a slit Mm -hmm. compared to a round circle. Now think about the context of what that means. Where is all the light coming from that's going into the deer's eye that's then transmitted onto the, the, the retina? It's coming from the horizon. Right. Exactly where a predation, deer, you know, deer don't get predated from above or below. It's always on the horizon. So what they're doing is it has adapted them. And this is going to be important later when we talk about the horizon cones, but it allows them to scan the horizon, particularly for movements. So that pupil opening directs their vision in that plane. Now at nighttime, their their eyes, like our eyes, open up, the, allows more more light to enter through the pupil. And I've never measured it, but uh, the pupil diameter at, at nighttime on a deer is probably somewhere around two and a half to three times the you know the, the diameter of ours is. Wow. Now anybody that knows something about objective lenses knows that the light gathering ability of an objective lens increases by the square of the diameter. Mm-hmm. So if it's if if for for we say that a deer's pupil opening is three times the size of ours, that would mean they would have nine times the ability to gather light in low light conditions as we would, Wow, mm. which is why they can go through the woods at nighttime and we can't, right? Yep. That's one reason. Okay. So that's part of it. So the deer, the light comes in the deer's eye. It hits the lens, which gets inverted. You remember this back from high school days, right? Mm-hmm. It's inverted and it's projected back onto the retina. And the lens is very different on the deer compared to us as well, but we'll get to that. But related to that light gathering ability, that light then goes onto the retina where it goes over the rods and cones and it creates a signal. But in a deer, as well as all other animals that have night shine, including an alligator or a whippoorwill, a raccoon, a mm-hmm. fox, and so forth, all those things with night shine, they have what's a reflective layer behind the rods and cones on the retina that's called a tapetum. And that reflects that light back out over those rods and cones a second time functionally doubling the amount of light that, re- that that those rods and cones receive. So that nine times their ability to see it at nighttime just increased to 18. Wow. So, that, you know, so deer are adapted. When do deer primarily move? They're crepuscular, right? Yep. You know, they, they like to move at nighttime. Okay. What, so, what was what was the word for that, Carl? Crepuscular. Crepuscular. Mm-hmm. Crepuscular, yeah. Morning and evening. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I've never okay. heard that. Daylight. Crepuscular. Yep. So not quite nocturnal. Daybreak and dusk yeah generally right right before and after daybreak and before and after dusk is what you know that's typically why we hunt mornings and evenings yeah right? sure interesting so, i i would okay. have said, i would have if you just asked me i said well yeah they're nocturnal but they they move some before and after but the word yeah, for that and, is and crepuscular. they'll have times of inactivity during at night time as well and they'll have some times of activity during the day that mm-hmm. you would expect um so, but there's there's a number of other aspects of this uh, of deer vision that's very important as well. Back in the early 2000s, we did some work in Georgia where we worked with the uh, some scientists from the University of California at Santa Barbara, and these guys were the smart guys. We just had the deer, so they came out to Georgia, <laughs> right, and right. we actually we, we wanted to get to this idea of you know do deer see in black and white or do deer see in color? Yeah. And, you know, even today, you'll ask some hunters, they say, well, deer don't see color. Well, we know that that's not true. Hmm. So we actually, what we did is, well, let me back up. On our retina, we have rods and cones. We'll go back to high school biology days. Mm -hmm. Our rods are what we see in dim light conditions, and we can only see in black and white with our rods. So at nighttime or when it's dusk out there, when you walk outside, everything's gray, right? Mm -hmm. That's because it takes a lot of energy to fire a cone. And those cones are just shut down at that point. So all you're seeing is with your rod vision. Well, that rod vision doesn't take much to fire, but it's also a much coarser vision. So you notice when you go outside at nighttime, it's 
kind of a coarse vision. Things mm-hmm. look kind of shady. Mm-hmm. And you don't see movement as well because it takes a long time for those cone, those rods, once they fire, to, to regenerate compared to the cones. Right. So deer have rods and we have rods. Okay, well, that makes sense. But deer also have cones. Now, for a cone to make to perceive, for a deer to perceive color on its cones, it has to have at least two what are called photopigments. We have three photopigments on ours. That's why we're trichromatic, red, green, and blue, right? Mm-hmm. We have a photopigment that peaks in the sensitivity of the blues, one in the greens, and one in the reds. And any other color we see is a combination of one of those three primary colors. Mm-hmm. Red, RGB cables, right? Yep. Okay. So we are what's called trichromatically, and we can see all the way from the uh, the very low blues out way deep into the reds. Mm-hmm. That's part of the electromagnetic scale that we see. So we went into the deer's eye to d- identify whether or not they had photopigments in there and what they were. And it turns out they have two photopigments on, in their eye, one that peaks in the sensitivity very similar to our blues, and one that's kind of halfway between our reds and the greens. So instead of seeing trichromatically, this infers that deer can see dichromatically. They see basically in two colors. In a human equivalence, it would be very similar to somebody that was red, green, colorblind. Mm-hmm. because they have the blues and they can set, tell the blues from the longer wavelengths, but they have a hard time telling the difference between green and reds. Mm-hmm. So picking a ripe tomato off a vine, I have a son that's colorblind. That's kind of hard for him to do. You know? Right. So, you know, so they, they see dichromatically. Well, that's based on physiology, but physiology doesn't tell you the whole picture. So subsequently to that, I had a graduate student named Brad Cohen who worked on this as far as his master's degree, but we wanted the deer to behaviorally be able to tell us what they actually see as far as colors. And he developed this really neat system of training these deer to an automated system that we could record a lot of data from a lot of deer very quickly and work with Everady energizers to get LED. We actually had LEDs uh, produced specifically for this research that had very specific spectral signatures. And we, with a food rewards type system, we were able to track whether a deer could see, you know, if a color is shown on the screen or not shown on the screen. Hmm. And it turns out it was came out almost identical to what we thought it would be with the photopigments. Other than compared to a human, a deer's ability to see in the blues is extremely enhanced. Hmm. Almost 20 fold our ability to see in the blue. Now, why is that? It's related probably to two things. They got much more distribution of the blue cones in their in the in their retina. That's one aspect of it. Is, but the other spe- aspect of it is we're a long-lived species. So in our lenses, we have a yellow filter, and that yellow filter filters out some of the ultraviolet light, but obviously some of the blue lights as well. So a lot of the light that's coming through that's blue doesn't make it to our retina. Mm-hmm. Deer don't have that. Hmm. So their ability to see blue is incredible. So why is that important? When you walk out in in the morning or the evening, what's the most common ambient light out there? Everything kind of seems a little bluish, right? Yeah. And they, that blue continues into the nighttime. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot more blue light than there is, are the, the longer wavelength light, lights at nighttime. Mm-hmm. And that's when the deer are adapted to move, right? So they're very in, in tune to that blue. And that blue gives them some ability to detect movement by those cones that require a lot of energy. Mm-hmm. So let me see where we go with this. So it, on that part, Carl, are you basically saying that a deer can see blues, quote unquote, bluer? <laughs> yeah. So like if here's I walk out in blue here's jeans. The way, here's the way of kind of getting an idea of what this is. Yeah. Have you ever been out on a deer stand? Do you ever wear blue, blue jeans to a deer stand? Yes. After this, probably you never want to again, right? Yeah, because right. Because they don't see that well. But if you look at some of the blue jeans, particularly if you wash them in a detergent that had whiteners and brighteners in them, yeah. And right about dusk, look down at your legs. It almost looks like they're glowing. Yes. Picture what that would look like to a deer. Hmm. There are two glowing legs sitting up in that tree, and there's nothing else in the woods that's going to look like that, right? Right. You know, horses are the same way. And if you go buy one of those blue mylar balloons with oh, a, yeah. on horseback, they're going to shy because of that blue, right? Yeah. So blue is something that's very important to them. So what, you know, there's blue light out there, but what else reflects blue? All white light reflects blue. 
So, because white is a combination of all, you know, the entire yeah. spectrum, right? Mm. So, why do the deer have a white tail? Mm, visibility. Visibility, and it's enhanced. It also shows blue, right? Yeah. It will show blue really well, in, at particularly at nighttime. So, that white actually is very visible to a deer, more visible than it would be to us. Mm. Because the only way we would see it was with our rods, but deer could see it actually with their cones. Mm. So, now... Further than that, that's this is where some of Geno's work came in. Yeah, is the distribution of the of the cones on a deer's eye is very different than ours. We have a very high density of cones in one little tiny spot called the fovea centralis. You might remember that from high school days too. Probably not. Right, right. I got it. I don't remember much from high school yeah. days. Okay, think about what it's like when a human's looking at something. Yeah. When you're looking at this, this computer screen, you're looking at an individual spot, mm -hmm. and your eyes are constantly active. A human's eyes are always dancing somewhere. They're right. Never still. Right. Yep. So if we want to look at something, we focus on a particular point in space, and we can accommodate, look, you know, with our just far far distance and near vision to, to bring that into focus. And what we're doing is focusing on that little tiny spot in our eyes that gives us really, really high visual acuity. Yep. Deer don't have that. Instead, if you look at the distribution of the cones, the blue cones are kind of distributed across the deer's eye. And they have a lot of those blue cones to cross their, their entire retina, about almost as high a density as we have in our phobia. So mm -hmm. that's one aspect of it. So they see a lot based on those blue cones in their eye. But if you looked at the other photopigment they have, one that we call maybe the yellow photopigment, mm -hmm. it's distributed across a band across the retina. Now, remember what we talked about with the pupil opening? With as the horizon. A band across or, uh, as a band. So what is what it's doing is put, focusing, the lens is focusing the light energy or the image on that band. Hmm. Now, the, their density of, of those cones is not near as high on that band as they are in ours. So their visual acuity is much less. But did, if you ever watched a deer's eye when it's looking at something, or look, you know, we have horses, so I look at a lot of what they're doing as well. When a horse is looking at something, they've got their head up, but their eyes never move. Right. You know, they could be watching a car go down the road or something like that, and they're just looking like this. And all of a sudden they go like this. Yeah. You know, they may move grossly, but their, their, their eyes don't track things. Mm. Instead, they hold their eyes stationary. And what that does is cause the image to move across that streak in the retina, mm. which gives them tremendous ability to detect movement mm -hmm. because they're engaging new cones as that thing's moving. Right. So basically a movie is being played out across their retina. They're not having to track it. And this kind of comes into play with predator avoidance, but also think about a deer running through the woods. Yeah. We run through the woods. We have to fall, look at every stick, twig, tree, you know. Yeah. So we don't trip over that rock and stuff like that. Our eyes are constantly trying to find all this stuff. Mm -hmm. This kind of plays as a movie as the deer is moving through the woods. It just plays across their entire retina. Wow. And they don't ever have to move their eyes, which is pretty cool as heck, isn't it? Yeah. So their ability to detect movement is, is really, really enhanced. <laughs> But that it comes at a, a cost because their visual acuity really stinks. So it's blurry. Yeah, because, you know, well, it's not necessarily blurry. It's movement creates acuity. Yeah, in them. yeah. So you've always had that. You always had that experience where a deer walked up for two years. He looked up at you in a stand. A human would look up and say, oh, there's a human sitting yeah. on that stand. What's the deer say? I don't know what that is. Yeah. yeah. Or if you walk out into a field and you look at the other end of the field, there's a deer standing down there. They you don't can know. tell what it is. What's the deer do? Starts shifting his head side to side, trying to trying figure to, out, get, yeah. you, get you in 3D and stuff like that, and get you to move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And once they once you move, then you then you're busted, right? Yeah. So stationary objects, which means stay stationary when you're in a stand, uh, because they can pick up the slightest movement. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out we did some work. Of, I had another student who's uh, now uh, Dr. Erin Watson. She got her PhD at Tennessee, but under her master's program here, she actually looked at visual acuity in a deer. And it turns out that they probably see somewhere around a, a 20, 40, 20, 60, maybe even worse. They would almost have to wear glasses to see hmm. uh, the drive at a stationary object. But if it was yeah. moving. But if it's moving, it enhances that ability, right? Hmm. Okay. 
So here's another aspect. Oh, man, there's so much stuff in here. Um, our ability to see blues is based on our the, the cones that, that we have in our fovea. Mm -hmm. And if we get more than about 20 degrees off center in our peripheral vision, we can't identify a blue. You know, take a blue pen and hold it out here to your side. You won't know it's blue, right? Right. A deer does. A deer does. It sees it's blue all the way around. Hmm. So they're, what they have in focus in their periphery is as good a focus as what they're looking at with straight on. So they may only have 20, 60, 20, 80, you know, acuity, but that's 20, 60, 28 acuity is across 300 degrees. Yeah. Which is pretty impressive, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Literally almost your eyes in the back of their head type of thing. Right. All right. Let's add one more aspect of this thing. Okay. There's a, a concept called a flicker fusion rate which means that's the rate at which your mind or your, 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 your visual and uh, uh, your visual system can process information. Mm -hmm. You've probably seen these things where they have this flashing ball on a computer screen. It gets faster and faster and faster to a point that Does, it turns into a solid. Yeah. It doesn't ball, look like right? it's moving. It's yeah. still, it's still flashing. Right. Just mm -hmm. like the old TV screens, they mm -hmm. were flashing, but we, our eyes couldn't see it because our eyes couldn't reconstitute fast enough to, it looked like a solid object. Mm-hmm. Well, we also had, in a preliminary study, and we got a you know we got a student uh, Gino's got a student uh, finalizing this work, but in a preliminary study, it looks like a deer's processing ability is probably four, up to four times ours. Whoa! So they can see move, they can process that, that information four times as fast as we can, which means everything appears to be to them to be in slow motion mm. compared, huh. compared to us. Wow. So even so, if we think we make like a sharp move, like real quick when they're not looking, essentially they're processing in the peripheral in slow motion. They're, they're processing across their entire eye, whether they're peripheral, or, you know, <laughs> their whole processing is, is so much faster, which think about it. They have to be, they got to run through the woods. Yeah. Yeah. They got to be able to process that information fast. They have but to then be able again, to react. That interferes with acuity. So that, that's what they gave up. They gave up the ability to have really acute vision sure. when it comes to identifying wow. a stationary object to have very good vision when it comes to a set using movement. It, what, what is the word for that ability to perceive it four times faster? It's called a flicker fusion rate. Flicker fusion rate. Right. Interesting. Yeah, and, and, and there's, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch more aspects of that stuff. And uh, this, this student that Gino has, uh, Blaze Newman is doing some fascinating work at the Dearborn right now. Uh, I mean, it makes sense, is. right? If a deer is hauling ass through the woods and there's trees that it's dodging, it has to be able to react faster. I mean, we couldn't run through the woods that fast and react that quickly. It, think about this. You always hear about a deer jumping the string, right? Yeah. And pe pe people put silencers on their bow. Yeah. Is it is it the sounds getting there or the deer detecting the movement? Holy balls. That's crazy. You remember the speed of sound and the speed of an arrow. Think about it. Yeah. Versus the speed of light. Yep. So their ability to perceive that movement, whether it's the bow movement or they could actually see the arrow movement. What's your gut? Do you think that they see it moving versus hearing I, well, it? Well, it doesn't make sense that they can react that quick just from the sound because Jeez. it takes sound, it takes a while for the sound to get there, right? Holy cow! <laughs> Mind blown. So, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. I've never tested it. You know, I mean, it makes sense. Here, I got a couple it, questions. It just yeah. makes sense. You know, because of that, that ability to see the movement and they can process it so fast. We don't have Nick with us here to, to Google it, but like, what, what are those? Do we know those numbers offhand? The speed of sound, sound versus speed of light. I mean, air, air, aerospeed, we can figure out pr pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can figure that stuff out real, really quickly, but. Uh, you know, figure the, the the think about a sniper that's shooting a gun. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. What gets there first, the sound of the bullet? The bullet. Yep. Yeah. By that time you the bullet. What's the speed of sound? Reaches. What is the speed of sound? Do we know? I don't know. Do you know, Carl? That's physics. Not off the top of my speed head. I, of it's sound. it's in one of those synapses up there. That's pretty dusty though. I mean, it is interesting in terms of, yeah, I mean, obviously Sniper is a great example in, in terms of, you know, that bullet gets there far beyond, you know, the sound getting it's, there. It's roughly 300 and between 330 and 340 meters per second is what I'm seeing. Okay. Let's do speed of and sound tri in Basically feet. triple that for feet per second. Yeah. So 900 feet per second. 1,087 1, feet, per second. feet per second. Yep. Speed of sound. Which would be so your sound's slower than most uh, bullets, 
but faster than all arrows. Correct. Yeah, but not that much faster. Yeah, quite a bit faster, right? Mm-hmm. Your arrow's 300 feet per second. Yeah. So, say so, so they would hear faster. Yeah, but think of how much time, you know, on a 20 yard shot, how much difference that would make. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. How, how so? Anyways, it's, 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 it's something neat to think about, something neat to play with. But the other thing I was wondering is, you know, you mentioned the, uh, the flicker fusion rate and also different levels of the, um, uh, whatever you call them, rods and cone levels, ability to detect mm-hmm. different, uh, used a lot of big words there that are too big for me. But, uh, are, are there actual, like, how are those measured? Like, what, what, what tool or mechanism would you use to say, okay, deers or, or any creatures flicker fusion rate is this compared to humans is, is this, how, how can we know that? Uh, we, we did that behavior. We let the deer tell us when they could. So the deer were, deer were trained that when they saw a, some, a something flashing on the screen that they would get a food re- reward, you know, this, this, this type of behavioral research. And so when it got to research. a point where it was just a solid screen versus a solid screen, they, they couldn't pick one versus the other. And you would test that against like a, a human. You'd have a, a human look well, at humans, the thing. Humans, we know we know all this stuff with a human. That's that, that stuff's all been tested, you know. In, in the, so we already have the, that down. Medical literature. Yeah, yeah. So, um, wanted to say one more thing about can, uh, color vision as well, and that has to and deer vision as it relates to camo. Okay. So, given that deer don't have that real fine acuity, yep. The mimicry patterns type camo is probably not that important right because they can't see the details they don't know if it's a le- oak leaf or a beech leaf or whatever on that camo pattern right? Right, right right that's not as important probably not as important as the color okay sure and it's the color as it's related to the background that you're camouflaging against okay now we don't if you look at a lot of modern camo um it's got that there's a lot of times it tends to have some white in it yeah grays in it uh, and many times those are enhanced uh, by whiteners and brighteners. Yeah. If you look at them at, uh, in, in low light conditions, they're very vivid. Yeah. And that white reflects blue. Yeah. So wearing those camos that have a lot of white in them is going to be very vis- visible to a deer, even though the rest of the, the, the pattern, you know, may be dark. Right. And, and most gonna, people would, it, would say, well, that's my breakup camo. Right. I mean, right. It, it, you know, to, to break me up from whites being background, darks being. Okay. That's a very important point. What is your background? Yeah. Now the flip side of that is if you're up in a tree mm-hmm. after the canopy has gone, yeah. what is your background? It's gray. Yes. Right. Which means there's probably a lot of blues in there as well. A lot of whites and stuff like that. Yeah. That's why, that's why sick. It has a camo called elevated. Yep. Elevator's got a lot of whites in there that matches the gray sky. Mm-hmm. Well, and see the kickback to that, Carl, from, you know, and again, I think this is why I really wanted to have this discussion. Not that we're favoring one pattern over the other necessarily, though Jared and I both wear um, Sika and, and Elevated. A lot of people will say, well, that camo is gray, which means it has a lot of blues, which means that deer can see it better. But it's blues against a blue background. Right. Okay, so you got a blue sky, and if you have snow on the ground, you got the reflection. What what snow is white? That's going to reflect all the colors, including blue, right? So it's going wow. to be reflecting just like the camel pattern. Now, if you were wearing elevated on the ground underneath a canopy, all those blues are already absorbed by the canopy, you <clears> know, <throat> for, for, for photosynthesis. Uh, so there's not a lot of ambient blues, so they're going to stick out. Right. So you need a different camel pattern, and that's why they most can, you know Kisika has different colors. Sure. Different They've got like that or early season pattern. Match your camo to the background that a deer is going to see you in against. Interesting. Not what you see yourself against as you're walking into the stand, but if you're in a tree stand, yep. what's, the, what's the background behind you, hmm. up mm-hmm. above you? Mm-hmm. That's or if you're on the ground, you know what's your background? T- t- tough to uh, tough to plan for, you know, like because even in a in a tree stand, easy like, to plan for in in late November or December, it's going to be no leaves on the trees, sky behind you. Well, yeah, but I mean, the, the purpose of like when you hang a tree stand is you're trying to have as much of the tree being your background as possible. You want to try to eliminate horizon as much as you can. Well, I think that would be a different piece of it, right, Carl? That would be more on the like silhouette side and the horizon vision. Right, right. And, 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 and you know, you try to have that tree in your background, but, you know, deer can come from the side as well. And then you look like a big, if you were wearing dark camo, you look like a big golden bump on that tree. Yeah. 
So, Whereas if you were I, I, if you were grays and they looked to the side and the sky was still blue, well, that's and why gray. I'm saying it's tough to plan for because if they're looking at you the way that you plant you hung the stand for, they're going to see a big blue ball in front of a dark tree, right? No, they're going to see they're going to see something that looks like the sky right through that tree. It's almost going to look like a break in the tree mm. more, more than anything. Yeah, interesting. Versus like yeah. just a spot in the tree. So you would err on the yeah. side of camos that reflect have more whites and grays. Only, you know, you know that, that's what I was talking about. The, the white that's in the sicka. First of all, yeah, the white that's in the sicka matches that background a lot better. Yeah, uh, against a gray sky. Yeah, you know, yeah. like like you would have in, up in the Midwest or up north during October on, you know, yeah. late October on. Yeah, uh, it does a great job at that. If I would never wear that in September in a bow bow stand. Right, because there's no, it's the closed canopy. Because there is no blue. You got canopy, I, right? I see. So you want something different. You want to either match the tree or match the canopy, right? One of the two. Mm -hmm. Would you both. would you want to, yeah, I guess you would want to match it, huh? What 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 color would be like at the, can they not see at all? Like, would, would be between their two spectrums that they really can see? If it's blue. No, and, they, can, they can see all the way through that spectrum. Mm -hmm. They see mm -hmm. blues and actually see a little bit further into the blue spectrum than we do, but not that much further. But they, So they can actually see some a little bit into the UV light, uh, but they don't see as far into the red part of the spectrum as we do. So do so reds dark, look gray to them? No, look black. Black. Yeah, a dark, dark, dark red would look black. You know, have you've seen reds got really red, got really red. Yeah, it just fades into black. Mm -hmm. There's just a phase into black at a shorter wavelength. So when people back in the day were wearing red flannels through the woods, it wasn't yeah. like we saw red flannels. It was basically a black blob moving through. It was a black blob or black with those, you know, a little bit less black, you know, yeah. the red wasn't as vivid to them as it was to us. So what about, um, you know, I know Jared and I are both pretty specific on uh, headlamps going in. Green headlamp, red headlamp versus a white headlamp. Good question. That's a great question. I, I mean, any, it, it, would it be make sense for me to have a red headlamp versus a green one? Frankly, I wouldn't care if you used a white one. Really? Because what does it, how does a deer know there's something behind that light? Movement? Deer, deer aren't, deer aren't necessarily afraid of light. They see lightning, they see vehicle, you know, yeah. they see, it, it would be the they, source know, they, of they light. see lightning bugs. Can there's they nothing see? inherently uh, inherent in a deer that says there is light. Therefore there must be a human coming to his deer stand. Right. And, you know, I spent a lot of time in my younger days out at, at nighttime following a dog around the woods coon hunt. Mm-hmm. And I learned a lot about how deer respond to that as well. And a lot of times with a really bright coon hunting light or even, you know, even on dim or something, like that, you can walk right up on a deer yeah. at nighttime because they have no concept behind that light. That's why deer get hit by vehicles. They don't know whether there's a vehicle behind that light. Right. So there's no reason for them to be inherently afraid of a light. I hmm. think the biggest mistake people make is going into their stand too late where the deer, where, you know, where there actually is enough light for the deer to see the human. Mm-hmm not using their flashlight. But if I'm going into my deer stand a half an hour before light in the morning, mm -hmm. I don't worry about what kind of flashlight I carry in hmm. for two reasons. One deer aren't necessarily afraid of it. And two, any deer that were there probably wouldn't have been there anyways by, by the time it gets light. Well, we had an interesting conversation with um, Johnny Stewart, who hunts a lot of the Allegheny National Forest, and he does most of his tree stand hangs and even some of his camera scouting and stuff at night because he's like, listen, these when are these deer you know, uh, hunted slash feared by humans during the night. They're not like, they don't feel they're not threatened during the nighttime. And probably also because they're not afraid of the light. He's like, yeah, I can go in there and I can work in an area and come out. And the next morning there's a buck in there and it, you know, he didn't feel any pressure. It's not like I bumped him. I've walked through the woods behind a deer at nighttime with a light on the deer. And that deer just kind of walked on. He did that deer had no clue that that, that light was anything that was, Interesting. To be feared. The only way they can learn that, I mean, they don't have an innate behavior, an innate fear of light. They right. have to learn that behavior somehow. That sure. a light means bad. Right. So, you know, like I said, I I don't necessarily concern myself. As a matter of fact, I've been out in in the woods at times, and you could probably, you know, with a good quality light, uh, like I was using when I was coon hunting. If you see a deer out in a field, you can shine that light on it. And many times that deer is more afraid of the shadow that that deer is casting than the light itself. Mm -hmm. And based on that, I've burned deer right to me. 
hmm. because they kind of avoid that shadow as they're moving or running or something like that. And they're running, they run almost right to you and stand right in front of you looking at the shadow behind them. Because they're seeing that movement. In... They see the movement, right? They, oh. they don't know what a light is. Huh. You know, everything that a deer does, it has to learn. Yeah. You know, in many cases, it learns it from its mother. But, you know, you know, there is no innate fear of human scent. Mm -hmm. That's a learned behavior. There is no innate fear of just about anything, a predator. You've seen fawns laying down with dogs, right? Yeah. You know, when if their hand raised or stuff like that. Yep. Unless they're taught that, they don't know it. Well, I think that's interesting. Like in some of the areas that I hunt here in southwest Pennsylvania, I mean, I've got 30 acres behind the house, but like I'll be hunting, a, uh, you know, an oak flat and there's kids playing in the yard. 300 yards from me screaming and yelling. And so, you know, as much as I still play the wind and stuff a little bit, I, like these deer smell human scent every day, every minute of their lives. Like it's just there. You know what that, but, but context becomes important as well. We, we live out in the woods yep. and we have deer in the yard all the time. And obviously they smell us all the time, Yep. but I could be hunting, you know, 400 yards behind the house. And if they win me back there, it's a different because they they, they, they know. smell that in a place they didn't smell it before. It makes sense. I, I think they're way better at differentiating between what they're smelling, maybe, and, and even what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, it's just one of those things. Like, I used to hunt deer behind a high school, and, you know, there'd be bands playing and football practice and everything. I mean, there was so much noise. Like, I just felt like the deer didn't pay attention to, to that. But I'm sure if I was away from that further in an area that it wasn't, you know, used to than like A and F, they completely responded. <laughs> you know, some, 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 there's always, there's some huge deer that are killed every year in Georgia within sight of the Hartsfield airport. Yep. And you know what that sounds like when they, when a jet takes off, yeah. you know, so again, they're used to it. Yeah. Hmm. The Hunter podcast is brought to you by Stealth Cam. Dude, where would we be without our cell cams? I would definitely be divorced at this point. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I mean, the fact is, is I spent more time checking cameras than I actually did hunting prior to cell cameras. Now, at least my wife can enjoy me being in the comfort of my own home, buried in my phone, checking those pictures. Yeah, 100%. And dude, when it comes to uh, trail cameras and definitely cell cameras, reliability is, I think, the number one thing that we're looking for. Stealth Cam just has a long reputation of reliable cameras, and ultimately, that is the most important thing to us. They have to work. In terms of reliability, there's not a better camera on the market than Stealth Cam, whether you're talking about the Fusion X, the Reactor, or the DS4K Transmit. And most of them are under 200 bucks. Southcam.com, check them out. I think the vision thing is the one that, you know, and it's not picking on <clears throat> any, any company or pattern more than others, but I mean, think about the camouflage market in the last, what, 40 years. I mean, and how much, number one, how much money has been made. Um, number two is like, it, you know, I don't know. I mean, 90% of those patterns are developed based on what we see and what we mm -hmm. interpret as humans that would look to blend in. I mean, I, I think, Certainly. So here's a case in point. I won't name a name, but I was talking to one guy that, that was, you know, way up in one of the companies that are producing camo and stuff like that. And I said, you know, we, you know, that is not important to a deer, you know, or, you know, deer can see that really well, or, you know, we, I don't forget how our conversation w went, but basically it was critical of his camo. And he looked at me and he says, Carl, I don't sell camo to deer. Mm -hmm. And he's right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it, it, that's exactly what it is. I mean, people, you see a camo pattern. It, I, I mean, if it was super ugly, but deer couldn't see it, it wouldn't sell still. Right. Unless, unless you had a very good marketing ability exactly. and an education program. For sure. <laughs> so, but, but once they, once they utilized it and yeah, saw how good it could be, cause we could, we could build that camo. Yeah. It, it seems like, you know, I like if, it. if they, uh, we should, the technology it, probably doesn't exist. I mean, like an Eberhardt will argue that it's, you know, Scentlock has achieved it, but like <laughs> in, in terms of like, you know, Eberhardt at all, John, Who? John Eberhardt from Michigan. Um, the name sounds familiar. You should look at some of his, he's, stuff. A, he's a big Scentlock guy. And so, <laughs> Uh, but undoubtedly, like the deer trusts its nose over, you know, any of its other senses. And so e even if you had the, the worst looking camo pattern and a color that deer could see, 
if they couldn't smell you, you know, arguably you'd still be okay. So, I mean, that's, well, I think that's, that's the most important thing. I, so Carl, I mean, not to like dive down a complete different rabbit hole, but I mean, in terms of reliability of senses, obviously we just covered a ton on vision and see how critical it is. I mean, it, has there been research done on a deer's nose well, to and, detect and, how? And even within senses, you know, you'd argue that they're seeing this movement much better than they can see, like their acuity is, is not there. So if you could, if you could design a camo that eliminated scent completely obviously would be first and foremost and and two eliminated their ability to see movement mm -hmm. which is hard i well, mean well it's that's impossible. why you're in, i don't know how you well, do you're that. in a box blind that's why you eliminate their ability to see movement you send a box blind or a ground blind sure okay bottom line is you can't do either okay you could minimize the ability to detect movement or minimize scent but you can't eliminate it right you know? Other than there is one surefire way to be to eliminate scent as a as an issue when you're hunting, and that's to be downwind. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know the, the the sense of smell is 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 important to a deer as far as predator detection, but only and only if that predator is upwind. Yep. If that predator is downwind, it's totally useless. That's totally. why I said vision mm -hmm. is the most important for them as far as predator detection. Right. And if you right. hunt smart, you don't have to rely on gadgets and gimmicks and you know all this other stuff. Just make sure you're hunting a stand that's not going to be blowing the, your scent where you expect the deer to be. Yep. And when I'm hunting, I have different stands out there that I hunt in different wind patterns. Yep. I watch the wind and don't hunt that stand if it's going to, you know, take that. Not only, yeah, not take only that you're not going out. to see a deer that day, but you're also going to spoil that stand for other, you know, subsequent sure. days as well because you're just educating your deer at that point. So, you know, hunt smart. Don't, don't rely on gadgets. Just hunt smart. Right. Which is it's complicated when when you start to realize that you know that especially mature bucks will will uh, you approach know, downwind. They are they are trying to move in a way that they can smell most of what they're covering. Sm smell everything. And, and yeah, but they can't, they can't do that all the time. Or you know, if deer always walked up wind, they'd all end up in Washington State. Sure. Yeah. Right? Sure. You know, they, they they've got to go against against the wind sometimes, or yeah. with the wind sometimes. Yeah. Carl, on the vision side, you know, obviously from a hunting standpoint, we only care about from sun up to sundown basically. And you know, the 30 minutes before and after, uh, like as deer, or let's say on a, on a bluebird sunny day, I mean, how, what is a deer's vision like happening during those time frames? Like it feels like it'd be so bright. It would almost be overwhelming to them. Now, now remember that they, they've got the ability to close that pupil opening. Okay. So they're they're limiting the amount of light that's actually entering into the eye. Gotcha. But they're also focusing again on the horizon. Right. Hey, you know what else? There's another neat thing about this as well. This whole thing about the deer's eyes and that, that slit vision. Yep. Uh, or the horizontal vision. Deer have an ability to do what's called cycloversion. So if you look at a deer's eye when it's looking this way, and its pupil opening is kind of in an oval shape on the horizon, what mm -hmm. happens when a deer puts its, its nose down to the ground? It's now yeah perpendicular. You think it would go like this. Yeah. But it doesn't. The eye floats. As the head goes down, the eye kind of stays really? on the horizon. Yeah. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So even when you that's, think that's it... Why, that's, that's why it's so important, you know, that, oh, wow. you know, deer are be, being able to detect movement on the horizontal. Mm -hmm. That they even developed a way of keeping their eyes on the horizontal when, eye, when their head's vertical. So what's what's the purpose of the head bob? When, it, when you're doing this? Yeah. Um might some of that might there well it's hard to get inside a deer's head to know someday when i'm spock or something like that really <laughs> <laughs> but here's a couple thoughts you know the head bob one of which is they're trying to get you to move right they're starting to put their head down and say okay you know maybe it'll move up well. do you think they're really testing you that way kinda, i, I kinda can see that you. yeah or the other one you know there's a lot of there's that sometimes that side to side movement yeah they're trying to catch you in that 3d perspective a little bit uh-huh if they can move you against the background, they can pick up that movement. Hmm. But they can't. I, I, they can't. They have a hard time um, accommodating, which means looking near distance and close distance. Mm -hmm. We can look at something very close, right up to our face, or something very distance because the way our our retina, or I mean our lens, changes shape. Mm -hmm. and it's focusing on that fovea centralis. They don't de have that ability mm -hmm. near as much as we do. So it, it, whether it's close or far, it's the same acuity it, unless there's movement. Uh, I, I would say that they don't have any acuity, any ability to accommodate, but they, it's less than not ours. nearly as much as ours. We don't we don't have a measurement of that. 
Hmm. Have, have there been a, attempts to replicate and show humans, like either a photo or video format, what, what you are seeing? Yeah, and you can do that to an extent, but and we've, we've actually done some of that kind of stuff on our own trials and stuff like that. Um, but you're still seeing it through a human's eye. Right. So you're seeing what they th- see, but they're see- but you're you're still filtering according to what you're right. Yeah, yeah. So there's some bias in there, right? Yeah. So I mean, it, it you can get close, but I don't. And, and that would be the camo discussion of like, okay, if we think that this pattern is done really well, we're still seeing that pattern against some background with our eyes. Even if we tried to manipulate that, it's still going to have bias based on what we see, not they see. Yeah, one of the things we were kind of toying with the idea of coming up with basically deer goggles. Yeah. You can put this, put this headset on. Not beer then... goggles, deer goggles. <laughs> or, or both. I've had the others before. <laughs> they're, so they're pretty similar. I can attest. They're pretty similar. <laughs> I'm like, I feel like a deer right now. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure half the people just said, listen, honey. Carl Miller said, "If I get drunk and have the beer goggles on, I can be see a better exactly hunter, yeah. what deer see. <laughs> I'm gonna see like I can see." <laughs> and that was awesome. Whew. Crazy though. I mean, did uh, and I know we fishtailed or rabbit holed down into a couple things there early, which I think were really cool topics. But dude, you get into that vision aspect, and it's like my head's spinning trying to like, because uh, again the. When you when you hear and I think most of us or a lot of us probably knew that deer see blues better, like that that UV blue aspect better. Um, but again, you know where I kind of find myself even questioning is like if I'm wearing a uh, like a Sitka elevated, that's gray. Grays are blues. Like, don't I stick out? Like that's that's the immediate question I have. Um, but then once you hear Carl talk about, well, yes, but in comparison to the backdrop, no, you, you basically blend in like, it's just, yeah, my, my understanding of it is not quite there yet to the point where I would say I would make it, make a change or if anything, it sounded like he was in favor of things that reflect blue light when you know, later the in the season, once, is the, blue once the foliage mm-hmm. is off. So like mid November and on, you probably yep. want you know, like the Sika elevated type of a color. Like or I a know, gray. You know, we, we wore that Predator for a long time. It had a lot of white in it, and it seemed like it made sense for that. Yeah, especially based on what he said, and I didn't, know, but white reflects everything, including yeah. blues. But in the early season, you know, you want something that blends in with uh, the, the foliage better, mm-hmm. you know, so and so we, we bought a couple different colors of that Sika. What's, is it the Optifade? Optifade. Yeah, Optifade. Whatever the green is, yep. you know. And then we've had the the green deception from predator in the past, which I think would be a valid one. Yeah. It, it would be the, that's the translation of it, but, but those are probably better for interesting on the, the mimicry, the mimicry type stuff. I don't know how that happened. That was a notification on my oh. computer or something. Uh, the mimic type stuff, because basically the acute ability to see details just isn't there, mm-hmm. which, which we've known. Cause that's when deer look at you. And they, they can't figure you out. Like, I, Yeah, and it makes sense. I mean, everybody's seen that from a deer standpoint. I thought I had him on the headlight stuff. Yeah. Um, But then I, I, I get what he's saying. I still don't know, though, if they would see... I mean, based on what he said, it seems like the red would be black. So is there really a light? Yeah, I didn't get a chance to sneak that one in there. Because I think they can see light. Sure. They, they can perceive that, oh, that area over there is brighter. And if they hear you or... It, you know, or movement. They, because they can see in the dark too, so yeah. If you there's know. movement happening, right, right. But but it would be interesting, like if a deer sees a red light, is that a black light? Thus, not really anything. I think so. I think so. I think you're still better off with a with a black light, or I'm sorry, with a uh, red, red or green. Yeah, because green is also a tougher one to see. Maybe they can see greens better than reds, but not that much better. Be like a grayish type of color. Huh. Interesting thing. I mean, when you start to think, but at the same, but we've all run into deer in the dark where like they have no idea what the hell we are. Yeah, I, they don't like us. They see it there. It, just, it 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 goes back more. I think you touched on our conversation with Johnny is just that their comfortability at night. Like I think they perceive that we can't see that well in the dark. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, they just you know. I'm they sure. just feel more comfortable. Unfortunately, some deer are getting shot at night illegally, but 
for the most part, the threat doesn't happen until light occurs. Right. And even those deer that are getting shot at night, like, I, I don't know. They, I don't think they know. Like, they, all no. they know is <laughs> loud noise. Yeah. Uh, Alan's gone. Light, <laughs> loud noise. He's dead. <laughs> what just happened? I don't even know if they could perceive that. Uh, that's interesting. I don't know if they could perceive the deer are dead or are no longer. If they think about that, if they're like, What hey, happened to Alan? What happened to the guy? I don't know. He just disappeared. Oh, yeah, gosh. I'm not sure, but I don't know. Cheryl, she was yeah. really nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I think there's a lot of stuff there. It it does. Um, I mean, it, the big things, and again, not surprises. Uh, be downwind. Um, critical, and I think if anything, beyond the patterns and colors, is movement. Is movement. And For, dude, think yeah. about well, just what we were even talking about in the in the intro on like me shooting a recurve. There's a lot more movement I think that happens in a recurve than like, you know, just because it's it, like once I start drawing, I'm gonna shoot. You know what I mean? Versus like if I draw back on a compound, I could hold it there and not move. I think you'd be better off with a recurve personally, just in that one. It's just a more motion. condensed movement, yeah. Because 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 when guys get uh, probably the 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 main time guys get seen in a stand is at full draw, like at once you come to full draw, they catch they catch a little movement and then they stare at you. Well, per what he and was then saying, you can't help but move, and then they pick even you though off. you like like think about when a deer walks behind a tree, we're like boom, let's let's. Well, he's telling me that it's basically they're seeing that in slow motion because they're able to process it so fast. Mm -hmm. So even though we think we're drawing super quick that they're not going to see it, it's like slow motion. So if they catch any movement, they're seeing that happen. Yeah, that's an interesting. Uh, that, that what is it? Flicker, flicker, fusion? yeah, Fli flicker fusion, fusion, right, right, right. Uh, it's it's yeah. interesting to try to perceive what that looks like because it's not like things are literally moving faster or slower. It's just their perception of they're it just processing and, and ability it. to react to it is so much faster. So like if a deer's running through the woods and there's a tree in front of them, they're seeing that and being able to process and react to that thing much faster than we are. I wonder what they're because that that's that term relates to the vision aspect of it i think it's a process vision like the brain right so what would be the counterpart that relates more closely to hearing you know because we talk about duck mm -hmm. and arrows it doesn't seem like per the calculations yeah it was like what 10 30 over a thousand feet per second was the speed of sound a bow is shooting no more than three 340 yeah so I mean, even a crossbow so at five hundred, they're, def they're definitely it. hearing it before it gets there. There's no question. They're hearing it before it gets there. But are they? Can they seeing it before they're hearing it? Well, and and in that same breath, if they're hearing it first, can they hear and react faster than we can hear and react? That would be the question. Like if we hear the sound and react, if they're able to right. visualize and react faster, four times faster per Carl. Could they hear and also react faster? Like, is that all brain stimuli, I guess? Because if so, then yeah, they could jump the string based on the sound. React. It'd be interesting to see all that on a spectrum in terms of visual sensory. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them, I guess. You know, visual, audible, and, Sm and smelling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sm and smell. Smellatory. Yes. Uh, what is the word for that? Olfactory. Olfactory senses mm -hmm. uh how quickly you know each of these animals including us c could respond to something like that it's amazing that we kill them sometimes when you start to process this like that yeah, we're yeah. feasible to be in a bow stand 10 yards away and get away with what we do to put an arrow in them yeah well they just you know they they make mistakes too you mm -hmm. know they, they, they don't they can't react to everything in, in a way that i mean clearly they're good at surviving some better than others yep um uh, but but they all make mistakes so hmm. crazy well, we appreciate you listening to this episode of Hunter Podcast with Dr. Carl Miller. Uh, this is episode 108, and yeah. We forgot to kick that off with, it's Miller time. Oh, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> but we'll end it with that. We'll end it with that. And it's Miller time. See you next week. <laughs> Later. Take me